Cleveland Connects is made possible in part by a grant from PNC Bank. Some say Cleveland ranks dead last in terms of economic development. How and who can change that? And what can we learn from Pittsburgh and Louisville, two cities that have reinvented themselves and found new paths to prosperity? Welcome to Cleveland Connects. We're behind. Lessons from Peer Cities. Hello, and welcome to the Westfield Studio Theater at the Idea Center on Playhouse Square. I'm Joe Froelich, IdeaStream's Managing Producer of Community Affairs. Tonight, we're talking about economic development and the things cities must do to compete in the knowledge economy of the 21st century. Now, before we dive into that discussion, a bit of housekeeping. If you are watching us live on the web, welcome. We invite you to take part in our conversation by sending questions or comments via email to connects at ideastream.org. You can also share your thoughts, comments, and especially your questions on Twitter. Use hashtag CLEConnects, that's C-L-E, connects. And those of you with us in the Westfield Studio Theater can write questions on the cards you received when you entered. Just pass them to the end of your row where members of our IdeaStream team will collect them and bring them to me. The financial support to stage these community conversations comes, as it has since we began in 2012, from PNC Bank. And here to say a few words about our collaboration is Paul Clark, Regional President of PNC. Paul. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, and good evening, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to welcome you to Cleveland Connects, a series of conversations presented by Advance Ohio, the Plain Dealer, IdeaStream, and PNC. And PNC would like to extend our sincere thanks to each of our partners for this very powerful collaboration that we have. One is designed to lead an engaging dialogue on topics that are critical and timely to our community and to advance and sustain those discussions in a way that hopefully inspires engagement, education, and action. Special thanks to Chris Quinn and Peter Krauss at Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer Kevin Martin, Mark Rosenberger, and their team at IdeaStream, and the terrific news and editorial teams at both organizations who have done an extraordinary job generating substantive and informative content. Our community benefits greatly from your active leadership and support of Cleveland Connects and so many other programs and initiatives that make our community a great place to live. We have a terrific live audience gathered with us this evening at the Westfield studio here at IdeaStream. And in addition, tonight's program will be streamed live on ideastream.org and cleveland.com. An edited version of the conversation will air on WVIZ PBS on October 30th at 7 p.m. and on 90.3 WCPN on November 7 at 9 p.m. Tonight's topic is focused on Cleveland's economic progress, the impact on the city of Cleveland and the region barriers that exist, and how Cleveland becomes more competitive in this space. Joe, we're very fortunate to have you as our Cleveland Connects moderator this evening. Look forward to a fantastic discussion. Thanks for helping to shape tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for your support and your leadership on so many issues in our community. So why are we here tonight? Well, the short answer is that back in June at the City Club of Cleveland, attorney John Tinney one of the architects of the city's winning bid to host the 2016 Republican National Convention, gave voice to a growing sense of unease, that Greater Cleveland's Renaissance has lost momentum, that once again, during a period of sustained national expansion and prosperity, Northeast Ohio isn't keeping pace. Now, say what you want about John's analysis or his proposals to move our region forward. His message was about as subtle as a LeBron James slam dunk. We're getting our butts kicked. We're dead last or near the bottom in most economic metrics. Our population continues to decline at an alarming rate. Our economy has not evolved into an innovation economy quickly enough. We're still relying on heavy, or heavily on traditional manufacturing, which is subject to major disruption from automation and robotics, ironically enough, probably engineered in Pittsburgh of all places. Despite incredible efforts by so many amazing people who have tried to reverse decades of decline, we just can't seem to break through as a community. Now, there are all kinds of st statistics you can cite to support Penny's hypothesis or to dismiss it. For instance, if you're an optimist, three months after the speech, the Federal Bureau of Economic Analysis 
reported 2017 gross domestic product numbers for 383 metropolitan areas. Cleveland has the 28th largest regional economy in the country. We grew 2.9% last year. Our economy is larger and grew faster than Cincinnati or Columbus. It's bigger than Louisville and within hailing distance of Pittsburgh. But regardless of how you read the numbers, here's something that can't be said often enough. In the 21st century, economic reinvention never ends. Every city, every region, constantly has to make itself more competitive. There are no days off at this. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, with guests from the front line of economic rebirth in two peer cities, both with long industrial histories and both, like Cleveland, once among America's 10 largest cities. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Mary Ellen Wiederwall is chief of Louisville Forward, a part of Louisville's metro government. Louisville Forward is a one-stop shop for economic and community development initiatives, combining an array of public services that help create jobs and enhance Louisville's quality of life. Bill Flanagan is the chief corporate relations officer of the Allegheny Conference on Community Development and its affiliated organizations, the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, the Pennsylvania Economy League of Greater Pittsburgh, and the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance. Mary Ellen and Bill, thanks very much for coming to Cleveland, and thanks for joining us for this edition of Cleveland Connects. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge that Bill is a last-minute substitute for his group's CEO, Stephanie Pashman. After the horrific events of Saturday, Ms. Pashman, who lives near the Tree of Life Synagogue in Squirrel Hill, understandably felt that she needed to stay in Pittsburgh with her staff and her community. Bill, on behalf of this audience, and I'm sure everyone in Cleveland, please know that our collective thoughts and prayers are with you and your city, and we very much appreciate you joining us here tonight. Well, thank you very much. Now, both, uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to, we, we invited you guys to join us is that both your cities have, had, have experienced great success in the past few years. As Peter Krause reported, on Cleveland.com and in today's uh, Plain Dealer. We all, everybody likes a good list, and Louisville was just ranked number one on the Forbes list of thriving manufacturing cities. Uh, Pittsburgh was named the best city for job seekers by the placement site Glassdoor. In your minds, what are, some, what are maybe the two or three sort of key things that you've done that have enabled you to enjoy this, this run of success? And Mary Ellen, let's, let's start with you and, and Louisville. Well, you can't talk about Louisville's story without talking about the fact that we are the only metropolitan area in recent history to merge our city and county governments. And that's made a big difference. And it wasn't without its uh, trials and errors. Uh, there were multiple referendums that failed, including two big referendums in the 80s. And then it took the community coming together in the 90s and some community-wide planning events, a consultant report, and then uh, a larger event involving more of the community to say we really needed to get this done. And it occurred uh, iteratively. First, we merged some of the agencies, and then the big vote came in 2000. And the citizens yet said, yes, we're going to merge our city and county governments. And that's made a really big difference because it allows us to speak with one voice. It's allowed for great efficiencies as we went through uh, the recessions of the early 2000s and then the Great Recession. And so it's, it's been a real, uh, a real boon for us to be able to advance economically and to take advantage of the things that were coming our way, the opportunities for us. Yeah, and I think Pittsburgh has been able to find its voice and, and learn to collaborate without uh, formal structural consolidation. We have 130 municipalities in Allegheny County alone. Pitts, the city of Pittsburgh is the county seat. And so we've had to develop mechanisms to get the entire county, to get the entire region to work together, to collaborate, to, to find our way forward. And a lot of that is grounded in our, our technology resources, our two tier one research universities, our ability to get that technology out of the research lab and get it commercialized or get it into new companies that are starting in Pittsburgh. And that's a big part of what enabled the turnaround there. Well, let's jump in on a couple of those points. Um, in, in preparation for tonight's conversation, I talked with Bruce Katz last week, and Bruce has been talking about, thinking about, working on um, issues related to cities and regions for almost a, a quarter century now. And one of the things he said was that uh, he thought that Cleveland had, uh, as he put it, very good bones, an amazing uh, hand of assets to play, but that it, they hadn't been fully realized. And he contrasted that with, with Pittsburgh, alas to us. Pittsburgh has really had four decades of multi-sector collaboration focused on the future. Pittsburgh decided after the steel industry collapsed, obviously it took a couple years to, mm -hmm. to get off, 
get up off their back. But uh, they decided we, with Carnegie Mellon and Pitt, basically right next to each other, we can own the next generation technologies. Robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics, genomics. They invested at scale in a sustained way in their centers of excellence. And voila, you now have the result. It's a playground of innovation. Now they need to bring more people along for the ride because that's becoming an issue in Pittsburgh. But I think Pittsburgh has already had more of a collaborative ecosystem. And the success of any collaboration is to be an ecosystem, not an ego system. Because you have a lot of institutions in this town that do a lot of great work, but when they come together, they need to sort of park it at the door and start working together for the common good. Bill, can you elaborate a little bit on that? And I know we're going to talk a lot about collaboration tonight, but, but talk about the things that Pittsburgh has done in terms of getting its, uh, its, its, its forces aligned. Yeah, the, cultural uh, the culture of collaboration actually goes back 75 years to when the organization that I work for was formed as a way to bring together the business community and the government to at that time clean Pittsburgh up. I mean, it was the smoky city, it had a terrible environment, and civic leaders came together actually 75 years ago this past spring to begin to develop a strategy to turn the community around. And they moved forward and accomplished most of those big goals around the time the steel industry collapsed in the late 70s and early 80s. And the community came together again. And the second time out, they really focused on our university assets, on our research assets, invested in both Pitt and, and Carnegie Mellon. Pitt is more in the life sciences. CMU is much more focused, obviously, on the digital sciences and computer science. And, and, and invested in those universities, invested in the people in those universities universities and then put structures in place uh, to uh, unlock that innovation, commercialize it, create new companies and businesses. So it, you know, it was a very deliberate effort, as, as Bruce Katz said, over 35 years to create our overnight success. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I, I, I remember when, when I was a reporter a number of years ago talking with people who had been in Mayor Calgary, who was at the time about when the steel industry collapsed and that moment of, of of panic, frankly, because I mean, I believe that literally a couple of hundred thousand jobs in your region disappeared almost overnight. The, the talk again a little bit about what was the process of recovering from that and, and, and how did that sort of focus you on, on, the, on the things you needed to do as a, as a community? Yeah, it happened in the space of about three years. I got to Pittsburgh in 1982 to report for the local television, local CBS television station. And so that was just before the region bottomed out. So the loss of those 200,000 jobs happened in a three year period. 250,000 people left during the 1980s. I mean, what happened to Pittsburgh was arguably the biggest setback suffered by any region in the United States and, and in the second half of the 20th century until the hurricane, hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. So you have that kind of catastrophic event, and it's, it's horrible, but one of the, I guess, advantages, if you want to think of it that way, it just literally forced everyone to come together. I think, you know, Ben Franklin supposedly said at, time, at the time of the revolution, if we don't hang together, we will most assuredly hang separately. And there was that epiphany in the early 1980s in Pittsburgh, and it wasn't just the city, and it wasn't just Allegheny County, it was all 10 counties that saw that calamity unfold and that were experiencing it. And it just encouraged everybody in southwestern Pennsylvania to lay down whatever their differences were, geographic, political, whatever, and just find a way to work, work more effectively together to find a way back. And a more recent quote might be, never waste a good crisis. <laughs> Marielle, did you guys have a, was there a crisis in Louisville? I mean, to, to many folks who don't live there, Louisville exists one weekend out of the year. You're sort of our brigadoon, pops <laughs> up on the, the first Saturday in May. But I think it, was, it had reputation as a very, as a pleasant southern, a, a city that had, had southern charm and what became a, what, we, what I would call a rust belt economy. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment though when that something happened that your community said, we need to change what we're doing? It wasn't quite that, that salient moment like, like Pittsburgh had and what happened to you. Um, our story is a much more gradual story. Uh, like all the cities represented here, we are an older industrial city. And if you look at the Brookings Institution uh, research on this, a metropolitan policy program which Bruce Katz led for a number of years, you can really see a, a tale of three cities here. And so they categorize the cities and uh, Pittsburgh is strong. You're, at the, you're in the top tier, congratulations. Louisville is an emerging city out of that older industrial city. And then Cleveland is a stabilized in the third tier. And so you can look inside that research and learn a lot about uh, what are those markers and those economic indicators. So Louisville has had 
uh, an industrial base for a long time as well. We are culturally Southern, but our uh, economy is squarely Midwestern. And so we had a very strong manufacturing base, but possibly more diversified. So we didn't have a crash of one industry. And so we make cars and durable goods and other things. And of course, sitting on the Ohio River, we've had this make it here, ship it anywhere philosophy. When the manufacturing economy started to decline, 60s, 70s, 80s, you saw the same thing happen to our economy. It was just more gradual. It was more like uh, beach erosion. And then you wake up one morning, you go, wait a minute, I've lost my waterfront. And, and so Louisville, that's, I think that's part of Louisville's story here is that maybe we didn't get the wake up call as quickly and so we have turned around the, these, these ships that we're talking about, these battleships that don't turn on a dime, uh, with transitioning to the knowledge economy, but we didn't have it at the crisis moment that Pittsburgh had it. We're getting there, we're emerging. <laughs> um, again to this term collaboration that everybody says is very important. I want to go back again uh, to my conversation with Bruce Katz and, and, and the subject of his book, um, The New Localism, uh, where he says it's, it's about how decision making in, um, in cities and regions has changed in the 21st century. What we feel is new localism is a practice and philosophy of problem solving. So 20th century problem solving was top down, led by the federal government, led by specialized agencies, HUD, Department of Transportation, EPA. 21st century problem solving is bottom up, led by cities, but multiple sectors, public, private, civic, university, community, and interdisciplinary. The, the, the response to a transportation challenge might not be a transportation solution wide in the road. It might be a housing solution or a tech solution. So problem solving has changed in the 21st century and it's fundamentally being led by cities and city networks. So how does collaboration work on the ground? I mean, it's one of those things that always sounds good. Everybody says, if anybody's ever written a grant proposal or any other proposal is, we're going to collaborate very well. What's an example, Mary, Mary Ellen, talk about how does it work and how do you, more important maybe, how do you make it work? What's maybe a situation that you guys have dealt with in Louisville that, uh, where, you've, where this has been you can, sort of a demonstration of how it plays out? I think it's partly baked into who we are. Uh, we are a very southern, hospitable, friendly group. We get along really well. Uh, maybe also going back to who we were, uh, founded on the western frontier. Uh, Louisville was founded uh, in the 1770s when you were floating down on a boat on the Ohio River, or what passed Coming for a from boat. Pittsburgh, Coming from Pittsburgh. from Pittsburgh. We're searching new yeah. lands. Uh, you had to stop there in what became Louisville because the only naturally occurring obstruction in the Ohio River is there, the falls of the Ohio. So we became a place of portage and ultimately a trading post and ultimately a city. And so I think it's part of uh, baked in, into who, who we are. And so we've had a couple of those moments uh, in our city's history, in recent history. One of them uh, was getting the UPS hub. So we started as a river port and now we're a world port. And so we ship all over the world uh, from Louisville, Kentucky. But that might not have happened. Uh, building that facility in Louisville wasn't a sure bet and being able to expand that facility to meet UPS's needs wasn't a sure bet. And it involved a very brave decision to add a parallel runway to our airport, which displaced a lot of families. But without that infrastructure decision and without everyone coming together and saying, this is for the greater good of the community. And in more recent history, uh, there's not an economic developer in the country that doesn't have an Amazon HQ2 story. And so that was our latest test of how well do we work together because that response required one regional response. Amazon didn't want to hear from Louisville and Southern Indiana and all the places around it. They wanted to hear from one voice from Louisville and we were able to quickly provide that as a region. Yeah, P Pittsburgh, I think, as I mentioned, has a culture that goes back 75 years. And uh, the, the, the business community and government came together to deal with environmental challenges. The other challenge they took on in the 1940s, and they wrote about it, which is amazing when you think about it, in the middle of the Second World War, was someday Pittsburgh may not have a steel industry. And, and they wrote that we need to begin investing in our colleges today so that someday they will invent an economy that can replace steel. They wrote that in the 1940s. 
So that investment in those universities continued through that time and that culture of working together, primarily business and government in those days, was, was furthered by the success that they had, especially on the big environmental projects. And then in the 90s, uh, there was new leadership at both of our universities, the Dr. Cohen at Carnegie Mellon and Mark Nordenberg at the University of Pittsburgh. And they got together when they both got their jobs and said, you know what, our universities shouldn't compete. We, we can collaborate. Uh, you know, Pitt is very big in the life sciences. Carnegie Mellon is much bigger in, the, in obviously computer and digital sciences. Let's work together. And they encourage top to bottom in these universities. Let's do joint research projects. Let's go to the federal government and see if we can get funding for major community initiatives. And that created this, uh, the jump started this degree of collaboration in the technology space that really caught fire after the Great Recession. And as a result of all that effort to work together and capture our strengths and sort of marshal our resources, uh, we began to attract investment from Google and Amazon and Facebook and you go down the list. The only other thing I would mention along the same lines is what our organization did as the business community was really worked hard, especially in the 80s and the 90s, to foster a sense of region. How do you get 10 counties to think they're all part of Pittsburgh? And prior to that time, that was a real hard sell. And, and we worked on joint marketing initiatives, we worked on joint planning initiatives to attract state capital investment, anything we could think of to bring them together, to knit them together, uh, to make them more effective in thinking about the region as a whole. And I think that's also paid off for Pittsburgh over time. People talk some about alignment. That's a term I've heard a lot uh, in, in discussions here in Cleveland. Do you, in your communities, do you actually have something you would call a strategic plan? And then you say, these are our assets and these how they, how they align with our various, our goals and stuff, and this is how we're going to work together? I mean, is it, is it actually work that way for you? Yeah, I mean, just to speak for, for Pittsburgh and the conference, I mean, our organization does a three-year plan, and that's typically been our cycle. We're on a two-year plan now, but typically three-year cycles of really looking at issues and opportunities, talking to our members, talking to our partners in the community, including the city and the county and the, and the nine other county governments, uh, to really get a sense of what we should focus on as the business community to move forward. So it's a very, a, a very uh, structured planning process. We're working now on the plan for 2020 and beyond, and, and that's, the, that's the next phase going forward. Uh, and we've had to do that. We've had to have a way to sort of bring people together to think this through and think about how to move forward. It's one of the ways without having a consolidated government and that kind of a, so approach, uh, we've been able to develop a common purpose and vision to be able to move forward. And I think for us, a, an important tale would be our economic development strategy. And that for almost 30 years, uh, Louisville and all of the iterations of who's done economic development, how they've done it, had a cluster strategy. And so when you're a mid-sized city, you can't be all things to all people. And so you have to focus on what you can be best at. Uh, said another way, you've got to uh, hunt for what you were meant to kill. <laughs> think about that for a minute. But so for us, you've got to think about what's good in your economy. So we've talked about manufacturing is what we share. Logistics is important to us. Food and beverage is very important mm -hmm. to us. Bourbon is very important to us. <laughs> Not only is it fun, but it's also one third of the country's distilling jobs are in Louisville. And then, of course, we also have our lifelong wellness and aging care cluster, which is really unique to us because we have the largest concentration of aging care companies headquartered in Louisville than anywhere. So we're the aging care capital of the US. And then business services. And so for many years, we as a community have had joint planning efforts that have surfaced these. Uh, we've used consultants and then community groups to affirm them, and then we've worked this strategy. And if we weren't focused on these narrow areas where we know we can be the best in the world, we might not be as successful. And I also mentioned, too, the Amazon HQ2 process was also helpful in Pittsburgh. I mean, we, have, we do collaborate. It's part of the culture. But that really forced everybody to step up in a very short period of time to, uh, to understand our, our strengths, understand some of the challenges we'd have to overcome to be considered, and, and really unify the place. And I think going forward, having been through that process of trying to structure that bid and, and then being selected as one of the 20 cities that, that Amazon's considering, I think that's going to give us a stronger sense of purpose and an ability to collaborate going forward as well. Mary can you talk a little bit more about the, about the clusters and, and being, focusing on the things you're good at? Because when we, had our, when, we, when we talked before, you said something I thought that was really interesting in that it, you said it gave you the power to say no. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, you'll get people coming to you all day. When, you, when you're an economic developer, yes, you go hunt, but you also play catch. Okay, and so you have to know what's gonna be right for your community. 
and, and what you're going to be best at. And that's best at based on what's in your talent pool, uh, what available real estate you have. Sometimes your real estate might be friendlier to one kind of thing or another. Uh, and so you're able to say no to things that don't make sense for your community. And, and we've done that. The other thing that uh, is inherent in this economic development work is thinking about what kinds of jobs. I think for a long time in our work, and maybe across this country, uh, you know, any job was a good job. Let's create more jobs, jobs, jobs. And there is absolutely value in all work. But when you're an economic developer, you have limited resources and limited time, and you have to go after that which you know is going to be best for moving your community ahead. And so we've had a very deliberate attention now for the last several years on raising our me median wage. Uh, our wages have fallen slightly behind where we want them to be. And so there's lots of strategies that go after that. You've got to increase your educational attainment, but also spending your time on what's actually going to raise that wage. Uh, and so, you know, we don't want to spend time on things that are going to keep pulling down that wage because ultimately if you don't have a higher wage, a family supporting wage for your economy, you're going to see that beget other problems in society and your community. Yeah. And Pittsburgh's followed a very similar path in terms of trying to figure out what are we really good at mm -hmm. and how can we capitalize on and then what are those sectors we already have that have the potential to create jobs but create well paying jobs. So for us it's, it's the three things we've always done well, we've always made things, we've always made energy to make things and we've always financed the making of things and, and the making of energy. So it's it's advanced manufacturing, it's energy production, uh, and then it's banking and finance and law and accounting and that whole sector. And then you can use those foundational uh, sectors and those foundational strengths to invest in new ones. And so for Pittsburgh over the last generation, it was healthcare and the life sciences, you know, placing a big bet on growing that sector. And then the other piece was information technology, robotics, which has led us into artificial intelligence and machine learning. They were present a generation ago, but they were in their very early stages. And so we focus on those five sectors. Now, if the phone rings and somebody from another sector is interested in Pittsburgh, we're certainly not going to turn them away or not work with them. But when you talk about how do you focus proactively your marketing strategy, where you're going to invest your resources, I think we, we have the same approach that Louisville mm -hmm. does. One of the things that, that Bruce Katz talked about was how um, that you have many more, you have a lot of players at the table. You have government, you have the business community, you have uh, universities, you have foundations, you have other important players. Do you find that when you do that, that at certain points in time, so one sector may take the lead, uh, as a, and, and another time maybe they're, they're, they're like the secondary, they're the support one? And how do you figure out who takes the lead? <laughs> Well, uh, this business is a team sport, so uh, pick your favorite sport. We'll, we're, we're still in football season, and for us, we're really glad to be moving into basketball season. Uh, and, and, you know, who's got that ball, and who's, who's playing what post? I mean, sometimes you're the assist, and sometimes you're the scorer, sometimes you're the point guard, sometimes it's all about the center making the dunk. And so you got to know who's playing in, in what seat. And I'll, I'll say that also about how you organize economic development in your community. We were talking a little bit about this because we're organized a little differently. And you'll find different organizational structures in different cities, whether it's a private sector at the lead, the public sector, or a joint partnership. There's no right or wrong answer. You have to figure out what's right for your community based on who's sitting in those leadership roles in your community at that time. Because everybody's got a role to play on that team. I'll take the football analogy. <laughs> fair, <laughs> don't boo. fair. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but um, I think we take turns playing quarterback. I, I mean, everybody's on the we same team in, in Pittsburgh. Too. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least when it comes to economic development, we okay. seem to have more consistency on the field. But, uh, you know, historically, as I mentioned, it was sort of business and government. What's happened over the past generation is, is really the growth of the foundations. And Pittsburgh is blessed with an extremely large uh, center of foundation assets and philanthropies. And they've increasingly provided leadership and, and almost set a very high bar for the rest of the community in terms of what they expect the standards that we need to develop by. Uh, and then the other sector that's really risen in, into prominence and into, into leadership is sort of the eds and meds, you know, the universities and healthcare as a sector. And you know, both of them, eds and meds historically, they trained workforce, they kept us healthy, but they weren't necessarily making the big leadership decisions in the region if you went back a generation. And the foundations were writing checks, but they weren't necessarily saying, no, we have 
we want to set some direction for this community. And so what we've seen over the last 20 or 25 years is really all four of those sectors at any given time might be playing quarterback. But everybody's still willing in Pittsburgh to come to the huddle and talk about what the play's going to be. And once we've decided, then, then we're willing to either you know, be part of the team or, or, or actually execute the play. And I, and I think that's a really important part of the culture in Pittsburgh as well. Um, when I was, uh, again, in, in the prep for this, I, I, I looked at the, you know, obviously, you know, your websites and stuff, and when I looked at, um, Lou, at yours, at Louisville Forward, one of the things, I, I, first I thought, well, this is a chamber of commerce, <laughs> because it was, it was the type of stuff that you would expect to see there, in terms of sites, and this is what's available, and these are our, our assets and stuff, and I realized that you were, that you were the government, that you were part of the, the mayor's office, Mayor Fisher's uh, econ chief economic development officer, in effect. Mm -hmm. Um, and you said you thought that was a nice compliment. You were ha glad to hear that. But how has the, let's go back to this idea of, of, of what you did with, uh, with, with combining, merging the city and county. How has that enabled you to compete differently? And then also, when related to that, is you, go, you cross state lines. Your metropolitan area, whereas, you know, it's ten, you're 10 counties, but they're all in, in one part of Pennsylvania. You have two states to deal with, but how is, how is, how is the, way, the merger, how has that affected you in the reorganization of government? So in economic development, you have to speak one language, and that is the language of business. Mm -hmm. So they know that your government, they ultimately want your tax incentives, and they want you to expedite your zoning entitlements, your permits, and all that. You've got to work at the speed of business and speak business. And so the fact that you saw our website and thought, in your own words, it spoke to business was a huge success for us. <laughs> Uh, so we're that translator, we're that, that, that convener who brings all of the services to the table, but has to be able to work at the, at the pace of business. And it does get interesting for us in, in a bi-state region. And there are many examples of bi-state regions across the country that don't work well together. But we've actually had a written agreement between us across the river for over a decade that we do not incentivize river hopping. And that is really unusual. And so if you're, on, you're in southern Indiana and you want to move to Louisville Jefferson County, you can do that, but we're not going to give you tax incentives to do it and vice versa. And to go a step further, we actually talk to each other. So if Company X calls my colleague across the river in southern Indiana and says, I'm thinking about moving to Louisville, and then says, OK, I'm ready to take the next step, then my colleague over there has to call me and say, hey, I'm talking to Company X, and they're thinking about, about moving. And so, it, and it works both ways across the river. And that is really, really unusual. And I think another example of what is an unusual high level of collaboration in our community. Now that trust had to be built in Pittsburgh and it is 10 counties and it is in southwestern Pennsylvania. And I remember when I was hired in 2001, I, I asked the CEO of the Allegheny Conference, well, why 10 counties? Steubenville, Ohio is actually closer to the point than Indiana, Pennsylvania is, which we considered part of our region. And he said, look, back in around 1990, it was just too hard to think about how to cross state lines. It's going to be <laughs> everything we can do to get these 10 counties to feel like they share a place and share a future. And so that's what the Allegheny Conference really worked on for a decade, as I mentioned, in the 90s, to get those 10 counties to really feel like we're, we're all part of the same community. More recently, especially since the discovery of the Marcellus and Utica Shale, that vast uh, underground resource in Ohio and, and Pennsylvania and West Virginia, we have been collaborating with West Virginia and Ohio, and the governors of all three states have, have, have signed a joint cooperation agreement around certain aspects of economic development as it applies to the energy resource. So we're working together on some policy environments, we're working together on some workforce related issues, we're working together on some marketing uh, strategies to build a sense of the, this region as an important global center for energy. So we've got our tippy toes <laughs> in the Ohio River <laughs> right now <laughs> trying to see if, if how we can work effectively as a tri-state region and uh, I think there's a lot of potential there but I don't think we're anywhere near as advanced as they are in Louisville right now. It, it's really hard to do. I mean regionalism in Louisville has been really a polite cocktail party conversation mm -hmm. for a long time. Uh, putting it into action is, is a whole other thing. It's like graduate level democracy. Mm. It, it really is. And I, I have to say how fortunate I feel to work in that environment because I hear the horror stories from other places. And at least we know we're on the same team. And you have to get there by, by understanding the value that it brings. And so when, if my colleague from Southern Indiana was sitting right here, uh, she would say, well, there's no zoo in Southern Indiana. There's no airport in Southern Indiana. 
Um, there's no orchestra. There's, you know, they're selling the Louisville Orchestra, the Louisville Zoo, the Louisville Airport. And so seeing that bigger picture is really the beginning of making regionalism work. Um, we had, we had, there's a number of questions from the audience that deal with, um, with, with, with workforce development and making sure that you have the workforce that you need for the future and, and training people for the, for the kinds of jobs. Because if you figure out, here's our clusters, well, part of the, it seems to be unspoken thing to the people you're marketing to is, and we can deliver the people who can work in those jobs if you, if you help, if you come here and create them here. Um, I want to talk, again, go back uh, one last thing from, 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 from Bruce Katz, who particularly, he was talking about one of the things he, he really admires about what you're doing in Louisville on the, that, that talent development front. What Louisville is beginning to perfect is cradle to career. How do we begin to invest uh, in the early life cycle of children, zero to three, three to six, then K through 12, then community college. So they have the skills and technological sophistication to participate and prosper in the 21st century. I don't think we have focused enough on the early grades and in a, in a public, private, and civic way, really perfected high quality uh, education for the youngest in our population. I know you guys are very proud of the, of, of the, of the cradle to career. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that and how you hope to, th that that pays off for the, uh, for the city and for your region in the long term. Every economic development project has at least two fundamental components, people and place, real estate and talent. And so talent is just core to the work that we do every day. And talent will be at the core of whether or not you're going to be successful as a city or as a region. And in fact, when you look at the underlying statistics of our three communities and what put us in those strong emerging and stabilized categories, educational attainment is one of the big differentiators. And so 10 years ago in our community, uh, everyone came together and signed something called the Greater Louisville Education Commitment and committed to increase our educational attainment measured by those with two and four year degrees to the 50th percentile, which meant we were gonna need to add 55,000 new degrees. And so at that point, we were below the national average in terms of folks who had those degrees. Now we're above the national average and we're making progress. And so we're up to about 43% of our population has a two or four year degree. And that's what site selectors are looking at. And that's what companies are looking at when they're thinking, am I gonna expand in this community? And so you gotta think about where, where your workforce is. And it's not just four year degrees, it's two year degrees, credentials, certificates, and building an entire ecosystem around that and then pushing back all the way into the pipeline. You've got all these people at the top end who are already in the workforce, you're gonna to need to be retrained, you're gonna need credential and certificate programs for them. You need your high schools to realign around what are the degrees and the careers of tomorrow. And so we're very excited about what's going on in our Academies of Louisville program that's in most of our high schools in Jefferson County Public Schools now. And then all the way to what Bruce was talking about, about those very early grades. And, and how many words is a child hearing? Uh, before they go to school. Are they ready for school? You know, now we test kindergarten readiness. Uh, wrapping these services around our children too. We put so much burden on our public schools and yet they have our kids six and a half hours a day, 180 days a year. We, the community, have them all of the time. And so having cradle to career programs and solutions that address that entire ecosystem is really gonna be the, the game changer. That you talk, look for game changers and needle movers, education is it. Well, and I think it's, it's true. I mean, we hear the same thing. The number one factor driving uh, a, a location decision after the location mm -hmm. is the availability of workforce. And, and Pittsburgh, we're fortunate because we have a highly educated uh, and, and very skilled workforce. The challenge we face is we have an older workforce. And in that respect, we're very similar to Cleveland. We have a large population in our region of people 65 plus, and we have an awful lot of baby boomers still in the workforce. Good news is they're well educated, they're highly skilled, they work really well. Bad news is there are 300,000 of them and they'll all be eligible, eligible for retirement by 2025. Uh, and that's about 22% of our workforce. So we have a significant challenge uh, to fill that pipeline and make sure we can replace that workforce with, with competent people who are ready to take over, basically, over the course of the next decade or so. Uh, there's many players, uh, as there are in both of our communities, in terms of working on this challenge, 
what we've determined the business community can do in the private sector, and obviously that's who I represent, is really understand that future demand. Understand, you know, what, do, what, what does occupational demand look like? What are employers going to need? And do we have a sufficient pipeline? So we actually took a 10-year forward look at, at uh, occupational and industry and sector demand across all, across the entire southwestern Pennsylvania economy. Uh, to really identify where are the hot spots and where are the mismatches. And so we've been able to, to use the results of that analysis, it's called inflection point, to sit down with K through 12, sit down with post-secondary education, explain the future dynamics to them, and then sit down with employers and say, you've got to change what you're doing. Based on your current practices, you are not going to replace those baby boomers in time. So we really feel it's the role of our organization as a private sector group to kind of educate southwestern Pennsylvania and give everyone a, a common roadmap for how we can address this challenge going forward. How important, I mean, we're, we're all, I, I, as I noted when I, when I introduced this, that we're all cities that at one point in time are among the 10 largest cities in the country. Um, Cleveland is in population now is about, within the city limits itself, is roughly half of what it was uh, at its peak. Um, we actually are, for about the last four decades, have had the same regional population. We just cover a lot more ground, sort of like many middle-aged people. <laughs> and the question... <laughs> And the question I find myself, though, is how important is population growth? Is that a metric that we should be worried about or that we should judge ourselves on? Do you want to start with I, I, I have a famous thing I say about this. In the business of cities, size matters. Uh, you really do. I mean, it, that size means density. That size means economies of scale. And you've got to have enough people to power certain things in your economy. And so, you know, we sit right now as the 45th largest MSA. And pretty much when you drop out of the top 50, yeah, you, you, get, you can get irrelevant pretty quickly. When you think about who we see on the uh, sports channels on the weekends, that's your top 40 usually. And so th it really does matter how many people you have. And I don't think there's a community in the country that doesn't have a talent attraction initiative right now. We've got a big one. We're really happy to be on the top 15 list for millennials to move to because we need you. We love millennials in Louisville. Come to Louisville. Don't leave Cleveland, though. <laughs> so Cleveland yeah. needs you, too. We want to poach from the south and the west. Bring them all up right. our yeah, way. Yeah, all, right? all of those southeast and sunbelt uh, millennials come on Turn our way. Around. Beautiful right. four-season weather. It's great. It's great here in the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> I, and population, I mean, we're, we're spending a lot of time thinking about that because Pittsburgh and Cleveland are really two of the outliers in the United States in terms of the sheer size of the populations we have that are 65-plus. And, and in a lot of ways, it's wonderful. It adds a lot of stability to both of our economies. But at some point in the future, if we don't find a way to replace them, if we don't find a way to attract more people to our communities, we are uh, going to run into challenges just, keep it, just sustaining our economies and sustaining the vitality of our communities. Uh, for Pittsburgh, the good news is in recent years, we've stabilized. So although we're slightly, depending on the year, we might go up or down a little bit, we're largely stable, but we've got to do a lot more, both to replace the retiring baby boomers and make sure we can sustain the economy at that level, and in the long run, you know, sustain the overall uh, size and strength of the population, because that, that helps pay for all the wonderful assets we have, whether it's a great symphony orchestra or a terrific zoo exactly. or, you know, name it, your wonderful parks. Or, uh, you know, we need people to be able to do that, and, and uh, we've got to solve that problem going forward, that challenge. A lot of the questions that we've, we've got from the audience have, have, have kind of revolved around the theme of, of inclusion. Um, in particular, it was an idea that, that Bruce Katz referred to, I think, in the first one where he talked about Pittsburgh, was that uh, about extending the prosperity of people, particularly African Americans and other minorities who haven't enjoyed the, 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 the fruits of prosperity. I mean, that's a problem, and I think, in all of our cities. Mm -hmm. How important, from your, where you folks sit, in, in government, in the private sector, how important is, is that type of inclusion, of making sure that we can grow the pie and bring more people to the table to participate in what we're doing, but also just to enjoy, the, uh, enjoy that success? Increasingly important for Pittsburgh. You know, for many years, and I, and I worked as a reporter for 20 years before I got my, you know, my current job, and for almost all that period, 
number one job for elected officials for government was create jobs. You know, we, we got to create enough jobs to put everybody back to work. That's all what the focus was, right? It wasn't the quality of the job necessarily. It was jobs, just jobs, 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 whatever any of us can do. What we found around 2011 was the sentiment in Pittsburgh started to change. And I think maybe coming out of the Great Recession, we did better than many other places in the United States. And when we surveyed our members, all of a sudden they started saying, you know, we're doing pretty well right now. It feels pretty good on average. It's looking great. But we look around town and we can see there are people in places that have been left behind. They're just, we didn't bring everybody along with us. So that became more and more of an imperative for us as a private sector organization to really think about that. One, one of our members even asked, you got to put the word community back in your name, the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. How are we going to come to grips with that? So when we retooled our most recent agenda, it's literally, to give it a title, creating a next generation economy for all. And we're following the lead as well and working very closely with Mayor Peduto of Pittsburgh, who says if it's not for all, it's not for us. And, and I think that's beginning to really pervade all of our thinking about how to do economic development, how to grow po a population, and how to provide opportunity going forward. Inclusion is not a social agenda. It is an economic imperative. If people in your community are systemically left behind, your community will ultimately be left behind as well. And as older cities, we are all struggling with the decades throughout the 20th century of strategic disinvestment and discrimination and overcoming those and breaking up pockets of poverty. And so we've had a very deliberate focus around this. Uh, when we looked at that uh, data we get every September from the American Community Survey, it's kind of like Christmas morning for the data geeks. And, and we were looking at how well the city was doing. And in all measures, we were doing great a few years ago, except for one. Our African American population was not enjoying the prosperity that was coming to the rest of the community. And so there's been a lot of deliberate effort around that. I'm proud to say in the last couple of years, we're seeing that, that turn around some. Uh, but we still have a lot of work to do, and, and that goes, again, to decades of discrimination that manifest themselves then in underachievement uh, education, uh, lack of access to education, lack of access to health care, and other supporting things. I mean, all of these um, data points align directly with education. So a little bit like a broken record here. But if you, if you take care of that part of your community, um, then, then everybody will, will do well. If you take care of your educational system and you make sure everyone has access. And to understand that equity and equality are two different things. We've achieved a level of legal equality in this country. We have not achieved a level of economic equity in this country, and we have a lot of work to do to get there. Yeah, in Pittsburgh, we're un, un, still undoing some of, I talked about the wonderful things they did back in the 1940s and 50s to clean up the environment and did this incredible development in the core of the city called Gateway Center. But the other things they did were literally bulldoze uh, yeah. in neighborhoods, largely African American, without creating enough new housing to uh, give everybody a place to live. And so that community became scattered. And they were cut off. They were cut off from their church. They were cut off from their school. They were cut off from grandma, who might help take care of the kids mm -hmm. when both parents work. They were even cut off from public transportation. And so we've looked at the region in recent years and said, there are, there are places in Pittsburgh where you cannot get from where you live to where you might get educated or trained to where you might work without three bus changes and two hours of commuting. And so there's a lot of attention. And of course, is, is there sufficient affordable housing in certain neighborhoods, given the growth in the tech sector, uh, to give people a place where they can stay and where they can continue to participate? So I think one thing we've learned is that, you know, uh, the, this urban transformation is not a real estate problem. It's, it's a community issue. And how do you preserve the fabric of communities and how do you continue to give people opportunities to connect uh, into, into, the, the, into the community and into that opportunity? And that's, I think that the good news is in Pittsburgh, it's front and center in our thinking. I'd like to be able to tell you we've solved it and we've got it all figured out. But I think everybody in town is really thinking hard about how to move forward in a much more constructive fashion. And I'll say related to that, that affordable housing is one of the major issues that will face all of us. Uh, I think we're already talking about it in all of our cities, but it's going to be a major crisis point, uh, particularly as our economy continues to leave certain people behind. Uh, and of course, it's very expensive now to build housing, any kind of housing, single family or multifamily. We have to address that. And that these are issues we need to lean into. Um, the horrific stories of redlining, 
Uh, you can look at those stories now on a Louisville map. There's a story map that you can learn about that and understand why certain things happened in our city. And, and each of our cities has a story like that that we need to first understand that truth from which we can seek the reconciliation that will take us forward. What is, is, what's the one key metric that you use to gauge the success of your, re of your respective regions? What's the thing that, that, you, got, that you make sure you watch maybe the, the closest? Well, I mean, we're actually uh, currently developing a set of metrics uh, that we can really use to establish a baseline for our region and to, and to measure our progress going forward. One is economic performance, overall economic growth. And, uh, and you know, Pittsburgh is not at the top. We, we regularly benchmark ourselves against 14 other metros in the United States, and, and we've been doing it for 25 years at this point. And, and we've been able to see where we stack up well and where we, where we don't do as well. So one of the measures we pay attention to is overall economic performance. Another measure that we're looking at very closely now is economic inclusion. How are we doing on this issue of disparity, especially African American and, and, and the white majority? And, and can we do better there? We're looking at measures that might, uh, might look at uh, sustainability as a measure. Uh, you know, the, broader, the broadest definition of sustainability is everybody participating. It's not just the environment. Um, so we're developing those metrics and, the, and our, the plan is as we go into next year to really operate against that baseline and see if we can measure continuous improvement across the region. Similar to Pittsburgh, we've had a long-standing record of measuring against peer cities also. Our effort is called the Greater Louisville Project. And so the lesson number one is don't just compare yourself to yourself. Mm -hmm. Compare yourself to your peers and who your competitors are. Uh, also, things to steer clear of, uh, worry less about the unemployment rate. Everybody gets all jazzed about that every month, and it's interesting to watch, but you have to watch it over a trend line. A few percentage points don't matter, and once you drop below 5%, it's, you know, you're in good times. Just enjoy that. Uh, but I'll, I'll echo uh, some of what you said as well. We're tracking, tracking the uh, median wage. We're looking at that very, very closely, median wage adjusted for cost of living, which then shows you a story about how people are doing in your community. If you track average wage, you're not really getting a good look into um, how that average family, the person in the middle, remember mean, median, and mo mode from middle school math? Uh, the person in the middle is who you want to look for and adjust it for cost of living to really get a sense of where those folks are. Of course, we're looking at our educational attainment as well as our creation of professional, managerial, and technical jobs because those are the jobs of the future. And so we're looking at what the labor statistics are telling us about what we should naturally create and then reaching beyond that with the goal of doubling it. And, and I would just echo to beware of averages. I mean, yeah. I think one of the biggest dangers our region faces right now is on average, we look pretty good. If, if you just look at the averages in Pittsburgh, you're going to say, we're done. You know, mm -hmm. 75 years, all this community effort. To celebrate success and go home. Exactly. Time to, time, to, <laughs> time to close the doors and, and shut up shop. Um, but the reality is you've got to go inside the averages. You've got to look at the median. You've got to look at the disparity. You have to look at particular places and particular populations to understand the real story and what the real work is. And, and otherwise, there's a real danger in complacency, and you won't tackle the tough problems. Nor can you get people to work together. Back to a wonderful thing to have a crisis or a really measurable challenge for the whole community to measure, uh, to rally around. If you don't have that, uh, I, I, in the long run, you're going to pay for it. Um, we're, we're very close to the, the end here. I want to ask you a quick, quick, quest, quick question, dear. Um, both of you, in terms of, uh, of what you're, you, you do, is you talk a lot about placemaking and quality of life. What's maybe the most important thing you guys, each of your cities has done in the last decade or so that's, that's, that's changed your community for the better, particularly on that, that quality of life basis? Cleaned up our waterfront. <laughs> we have a beautiful waterfront now. It's an 85 acre park that is the front lawn for the city of Louisville and we're getting ready to extend it and add another 22 acres and part of a vision to have 15 miles of usable riverfront in our city. Game changer for the city. Yeah, well, I, I would second that. For most of its history, Pittsburgh turned its back to our rivers. They were highways and sewers. So that was really what they were for. And then starting in the 90s, about 25 years ago, we been, began to embrace the rivers, began to build par linear parks along the rivers, bike trails. I would say the other thing Pittsburgh has really focused on is using arts and culture as an economic development strategy. And almost as a lost leader, to go into communities where nobody wants to be, let's put a museum 
there, or let's put a new performing arts play, uh, uh, venue here, and let's get some people into these communities, let's get them into these neighborhoods, let's create some vitality. And I think Pittsburgh, whether it's downtown, the north side, uh, out in East Liberty in the East End, I think you can see these examples all over town of how we've been able to leverage arts and culture to add vitality and, and, and really provide hope into some of these neighborhoods as well. Protect your downtown. You mm. can't be a suburb to nowhere. Protect your downtown <laughs> and uh, your edge neighborhoods. Invest in multimodal. Uh, these millennials we're all trying to attract, guess what? They're not all going to own a car. Uh, embrace bikes and scooters and other things like that, even if they test us in all of our systems. <laughs> Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a vitality in, in your place. I once had a site selector say to me when we said, you know, what, what, what's the worst advice you ever had to give a community? And he was truth telling and he looked at that community. I'm glad to say it's not any of us. And he said, you have an ugly downtown. Mm. No one's ever going to come here. So uh, <laughs> focus on a place you'd want to be and how would you make it better? And guess what? Other people will have the same feeling and want to be there. Well, as I say, nobody ever goes to visit another community and says, take me to your suburbs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you'd mentioned in investing in, in maybe places that, uh, that have been left behind. Uh, and I think with, with regard to when we talked about Louisville, one of the things with the extension of your, your waterfront park, aren't you moving into the West, what's West Louisville? Correct. West Louisville is, is our area of the community that uh, was discriminated in and disinvested in for so many years. A huge part of our city, 12 square miles and nine distinct neighborhoods. And of the $13 billion of new investment we have going on, a billion of it is going into West Louisville right now. And, and so building that back and protecting um, the heritage that is there and helping to provide new opportunity there and also guarding against the G word, gentrification. Uh, and, and a nicer way of saying that is having investment without displacement. And so these are very, very deliberate things. These are the things that we work eight days a week on. We laughed and looked at each other when you introed this about you know, working overtime and all the time <laughs> on these efforts. Uh, we've got a lot of making up to do, but we're very excited about what's going on in West Louisville. A last thought, we've got about 30 seconds. Yeah, only that we're seeing a lot of the same kind of dynamic unfolding in Pittsburgh's East End around our universities. Literally billions of dollars of investment right now, and so front and center in everybody's mind is how do we accommodate this growth, how do we attract this kind of investment, but how do we not lose the character of Pittsburgh, and how do we not lose the communities that make it such a special place. Great. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, that's going to conclude our discussion, but before we wrap things up, I want to thank our panelists, Bill Flanagan, Chief Corporate Relations Officer of the Allegheny Conference, and Mary Ellen Wiederwall, Chief of Louisville Forward. Cleveland Connects is a partnership between IdeaStream, Cleveland.com, and PNC Bank. If you'd like to know more about tonight's topic, I invite you to visit our websites. Go to ideastream.org and cleveland.com for in-depth coverage in the weeks and months ahead of this important community conversation about our region's future. I'm Joe Froelich. Thanks for joining us, and have a good night. Cleveland Connects is made possible in part by a grant from PNC Bank.